All right. Looks like we're getting people in there. Cool. Sorry about the confusion with the password thing. I think they got fixed. Yeah, it's okay. I'm in now. Thank you. Yeah, it's working. Hey! the instructor meeting earlier he's got a good story oh i can't wait man all right so my are you wearing family. are you wearing a shirt yes i'm wearing a shirt <laughs> florida state shirt no less go Knowles. go Knowles. my parents dog is about no, three months old, old. Four months old. And she ate a uh, one of my big black Nike socks, and then you gotta kind of stop and drop and go to the vet. The dog ate a sock. Yes, eat a sock. <laughs> what kind of dog is this? Golden Retriever. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Maggie, I'm sorry. Maggie. The dog ate a sock. <laughs> Dakota's done it multiple times on us. He, mm -hmm. and they're, they're not clean socks either. No. Oh, never. I'm almost from my laundry. Pull, pull yeah, laundry. Yeah, there's the okay. a cat person, and a cat would never do that. <laughs> no. That's true. A cat would gouge my eyes out, but a cat would never eat a sock. I, that sock <laughs> is longer than a cat. Although, I'll show you. Where did I put my wine? I lost it. It's one of these, like, oh, geez. Yeah, see, my dog only ate the little bitty socks. I don't know. I don't know how it happened, but she just threw it up with the stuff. Yes. Yeah. So right. I moved my pile from the ground to a hamper. <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to go ahead and get things uh, rolling here. Uh, and okay, bye-bye. Share the screen and, and bring the uh, um, PowerPoint up. Uh, Okay, so before we get rolling, rolling on this subject tonight, I do have an announcement to make, and this is going to be followed up with some phone calls, but we have uh, discussed it and, and, uh, and looked at kind of everything that's going on, and uh, our plan is to start flight operations again Monday, May 4th, so uh, next Monday uh, we plan to start operations. We're going to call each of you customers uh, to talk about schedules. Keith and I will be doing that between tomorrow and Thursday. So we have a plan going, make sure everybody who is ready to come back is coming back and on the schedule. And uh, we'll have those discussions individually with each, each one. We don't need to really uh, talk about it tonight, but we just feel that it, it going forward, that it, things are, are to the point where we can get back in operation. We are going to have some additional uh, uh, safety measures. Um, you know, we hear that the governor is going to be talking tomorrow about uh, uh, getting people back into 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 uh, not not necessarily normal but the new normal or heading towards the new normal and so we have decided to uh, we didn't think we could get it put together in time to start up on Friday which is unfortunate because there's great weather coming this weekend but we are going to uh, have everything up and running by Monday and we will be reaching out to each and every one of you individually by phone so if you see a phone number you don't recognize it might be me or keep calling obviously uh, if you can't take phone don't worry about it. We'll leave a message, call us back. So I think that's good news. I hope you believe that's good news too. 
So, um, going forward, ask the DP. Now, last week we talked about the oral exams. Today we're going to talk about the flight portions and the common errors. I had this aggressive plan that was going to go all the way through commercial. I started writing it, and there's no way we're going to get to commercial tonight. Uh, we may not even get very far into instrument, depending on how long the private discussion goes. Remember that the uh, anytime you want to ask a question, stop and ask the question. Um, that uh, that I don't want to just sit here and talk for two hours. Um, I want to make sure that uh, if something comes to your mind, stop me and ask it. I will be, as I'm going through things, I'm going to be talking about the common errors, and I'm going to be looking at the ACS for the items that we're talking about on the common errors to show uh, you know, what, what the requirements are. And so anytime you have a question on the ACS when we're on it, um, please feel free to ask. First, um, as we uh, talked about last week, we talked about the pre-oral briefing. Now this is the pre-flight briefing. Uh, we are required to give three briefings on every flight, just the pre uh Oral briefing, the pre-flight briefing, and the post-flight briefing. Um, so I want to just kind of talk through the point by point on this. Um, first of all, as the applicant, you are pilot in command. Okay, um, the examiner is not pilot in command, and so what that means is you're responsible for the entire flight operation. Uh, as a private pilot, it is legally your first pilot command flight, even though you've been able to log pilot command prior to this, um, this time you are actually the person in charge. And what does that mean? Does that mean that if the examiner says, I've got the flight controls, you can say, no, you don't. No, not really. Okay. This is a legal semantic that the FAA doesn't want uh, pilot examiners uh, to be responsible for the flight. However, if something bad happened on the flight, guess what? And the examiner didn't prevent it from happening. Guess what? The examiner is going to be the one getting the uh, reevaluation or the 709 ride by the FAA. So they do put a lot of responsibility to the examiner to stop something before it gets unsafe. And so that's why we have the uh, pilot uh, or the, the exchange of flight controls. And that's one of the things we have to have in this briefing. So when we talk about exchange of flight controls, we'll generally ask you, so if I want to take the flight controls, what do I have to say to you? So you can tell me what that, that, that three-step process is. Uh, you have flight controls, I have flight controls, you have flight controls, that type of thing. Um, and so um, we do talk a little bit about there are times where it is okay for the examiner to take the controls, and it will not be a, a, a failure per se. For example, when you're putting on the hood or the foggles, uh, for the uh, the uh, instrument portion or the flight by sole reference of the instrument. I can take the controls in and hand them back to you. That is not a, a reason for a failure. Um, that uh, um, I can't take the controls in the capacity of, okay, I need to do something in the airplane. Can you take the controls for me while I, uh, while I get my, get my uh, clipboard from the back seat because I forgot to put it up front. Now, that's poor cockpit management. I can't take the controls for something like that. If I had to, well, then that would be a reason for disapproval. So what I'm trying to do here is to kind of define some of the differences of, of when a pilot examiner can take the controls and can't take the controls. Because yes, it's considered if I have to take the controls for a safety of flight issue, then that is an automatic reason for a notice of disapproval. Um, an example, however, of where I can take the controls and it is not a disapproval is let's say and god knows it happens around florida all the time a bird is in front of the aircraft and i see it before you see it because it's in one of your blind spots i take the controls i'll say bird i take the controls we avoid the bird i give the flight controls back to you that's not a reason for a notice of disapproval because it was in your blind spot and those things come up so fast you know it, it was a safety of flight issue I, I needed to take the controls to avoid that, but it wasn't anything that you uh, uh, would have been able to see and avoid in that scenario. So that's another example where a um, uh, pilot examiner can take the take flight controls and not end up in a disapproval. Okay, collision avoidance. Your pilot command, you're responsible for collision avoidance, unless, of course, you're under the hood. Then 
as the pilot examiner, we are the safety pilot and we will be observing, looking for traffic. And in that instance, if I have to take flight controls to say, okay, I've got an airplane that's coming close, I might have to take controls, I've got flight controls. Okay, that's not anything you can do under the hood to see and avoid that traffic. So I'm a safety pilot, I take flight controls, I avoid the aircraft, I get the controls back to you. So that's why I say it's not clear cut anytime the examiner takes controls it results in a notice disapproval. It really is very much a situational thing. Uh, what um, do you mean by under the hood? Say again? What do you mean by under the hood? If you're wearing the, the view limiting device, uh, doing sole, sole reference to the instruments. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that, uh, that you've got the foggles or the hood. Hood is just a different type of device to restrict your vision. Okay. That's an old man's term. We don't use those anymore. They're archaic, but they still exist. Um, okay, um, clearing turns. Um, basically, clearing turns are required prior to every maneuver. It's not specified in the ACS as a maneuver, but there is an expectation for you to clear prior to every maneuver. Um, if you're doing a turning maneuver, well, you're doing a turn. So a lot of times it will say with a steep turn, clearing turns may not be required. Um, but basically, uh, as an examiner, um, you know, we're, we're expecting that. We're expecting you to take the initiative to do the clearing turn, not look to me and ask. If you're not doing a clearing turn automatically, um, that uh, um, I can't remind you to do a clearing turn. Uh, what that's showing me is if, you, if you're not doing a clearing turn automatically, uh, with without without hesitation, that means you haven't been doing clearing turns in your training. Um, that the law of primacy, what you learn first, you learn best, and you will generally do it. Um, that you know you stay, you start a maneuver, you stop yourself, and do say, oh, I didn't do a clearing turn. Great, no problem. But that's also why we have checklists, your pre maneuver checklists, those type of things, is help us to remind that. Also, in the pre-flight briefing, we will be reviewing the weight and balance. So a lot of times, we'll give you a weight and balance scenario for the oral that will be different than our actual weight and balance for, for the flight we're taking. We might put some fake passengers and fake baggage in the airplane. So we need to review the actual weight and balance of, the, of, of this flight to make sure we're within limits. You need to show us that you've calculated it and that we are in fact within limits. We'll tell you that oral questioning will continue and note taking will continue even in flight. Um, and um, that uh, the idea with oral questioning is, and I'll, I'll tell, you, tell everybody this, is not that you did something wrong. Don't want you to second guess yourself if I ask you a question. All I'm doing is trying to figure out what you were thinking while you were doing something. Or I might be really asking a question to a somewhat related topic that uh, I also want to know. I'm required to continue to ask questions. But for the most part, it is I wanted to know what you were thinking when you were, when you were doing a maneuver. Now, something that I recommend is if you're the type of person that likes to talk yourself through a maneuver, do it. That makes my life easy because I know what you're thinking while you're doing it and I don't have to ask many follow-up questions. It keeps you in control of the flight because I don't stop you and ask questions because as soon as I ask you a question, your, 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 your um, uh, perfectionist self says what I do wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. You just want to know what you're thinking. Okay, note taking, the same thing goes. If I'm taking a note, doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It just means I want to remember what you were doing, I want to have some details for the debrief so I can give a defective debrief. So once again, positive notes as well as negative notes end up on, on my iPad. And I do use an iPad uh, for that. Uh, it's just easier for me that way. Okay, then we talk about the ACS. So say we're gonna follow the ACS in, in, in the, uh, uh, for the flight. It's our guide, it was the guide for the oral, it's the guide for the flight. So we'll continue to follow the ACS. Um, We'll have a little discussion of some of the standards within ACF as well, but the big reminder is perfection is not the standard. We're not expecting you to do every maneuver perfectly. You're going to make mistakes. We talked about this last week. We talked about uh, Diego Alfonso's videos about uh, the psychology of the check ride and the rules of the check ride. This comes from the rules of the check ride, um, that, uh, and it comes straight out of the ACS. We're not expecting you to be perfect. You're going to make a mistake. It's how you manage the mistake that matters. And uh, whether it be a mistake on the ground, you, 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 on the oral, there will be questions you won't have the answer to. That's what we mean by you're not going to be perfect. In the flight, you're going to have a misstep on a maneuver, maybe off your altitude. But if you correct it, catch it and correct it in a timely manner, we don't have a problem with it. 
Um, and yeah, if there's repetitive problems, you know, off altitude two, three, four, five times, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be an issue there. But, you know, if you're making a mistake here, a mistake there, and they're unrelated, then that's not, not going to be held against you. So then we discuss the, the profile of flight. This is where we're talking about, you know, okay, we're going to do this takeoff first. We're going to go out to this place. We're going to do these maneuvers. And we're going to talk about every item that, that's on, on, going to be conducted on the test. Now, most people start trying to write that down right away. We're going to remind you of it in flight. We just want you to be familiar with it in flight so you can think about it a little bit before we go fly. Um, and yes, it does um, follow straight down ACS. Um, we don't necessarily follow the order of ACS. We can mix and match in, in where we ask things and we're supposed to make the scenario different. We're also supposed to use scenarios on why we're doing a maneuver. So they're, they're, especially with like emergency procedures, you know, we try to set up a, a full scenario so you can think of it in a real world context. Um, so that's what's discussed in, when we talk about the foot, uh, flight profile. We do uh, talk about the pre-flight and what's going to be done on pre-flight. We do uh, come out and follow you around on the pre-flight for the private and, uh, and the commercial for sure. Uh, so we can ask more questions about what we're looking for in the pre-flight to see if you understand what is a safety of flight issue and what is not. Um, we talk about emergencies, actual and simulated. Um, the first statement is, if we have an actual emergency, you, uh, the flight test is, is put on pause. Um, and uh, and uh, I become a crew member, and I can work with you for a successful outcome in flight. Um, and uh, so if we're in the practice area and the oil pressure really does go to zero, that's a real emergency. There's nothing I can do to turn the oil pressure down to zero. I wish there was, but that's what a flight simulator is for. Um, but uh, it, uh, it, 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 it is something that if you see something going wrong and it's real, you need to let me know. How do you know it's real? Because I didn't say simulated. I didn't say simulated engine failure. You know, that uh, before I can execute a simulation, simulated maneuver like that, I'm supposed to announce this is a simulated engine failure. Also, you just lost your engine, simulated, something like that. So you hear the word simulated. So that's how you know that what just happened is not real and you have to follow, follow the appropriate procedures as if it was real versus something really happening like the engine RPM dropping off, um, you know, and, uh, and you look at me like, uh, 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 you know, no, that's real. Test is over for the moment. We're gonna get that, the airplane safely on the ground. It is also my responsibility to do that. Um, we'll talk more about the actual maneuvers a little bit later on as we're talking about the maneuvers and engine failure will be one of them. No repeating maneuvers. A lot of people say, you know, ah, I didn't do well on that. Can I do that again? No. I can ask for you to repeat a maneuver if I miss something. If I didn't think I saw everything that I thought I saw, or, you know, that bird popped up and I took the controls, or there was traffic that was too close to us that was distracting you and me from evaluating the maneuver. Then I can ask to have you have you, uh, those are a couple of examples where I could ask to to have you do a maneuver uh, a second time, um, but uh, it's not something that you as the applicant can ask. Um, unsatisfactory performance. We talked a little bit about that last week. Um, if you step outside of the standards to the point we have to issue notice of disapproval, I am to stop the test at that point, take the controls of the airplane, tell you it's unsatisfactory, explain why and then give you the option to continue or not to continue. First, I have to ha make the choice that I want to continue. I think that it's, it's gonna be worthwhile to continue. Once I make that decision, then I give you the option, then you have the choice. Continue, if you do, anything done within standards after that point will be given credit for. Anything not done will be marked as incomplete and have to be done on the retest uh, in addition to the unsatisfactory item. But if you choose not to continue, no harm, no foul, let's go back to the airport, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll fit everything in the next time. Weather decision. I will talk to you about your weather decisions. Um, first of all, the weather decision is the applicants. I am have, I'm supposed to have no influence on it. Um, so you make the decision to go, great. We get out to the runway, you line up on the runway, and there's a thunderstorm off the end of the runway. You've accepted the takeoff clearance and, and cross, the, uh, cross the whole short line. Okay, at that point, that would be a reason for me to, to issue a notice disapproval because 
you could see it there and you didn't say, well, that doesn't look good. I'm going to turn back. And so that's where you really need to realize the weather decision is not just going out to the airplane. Even after you get in the airplane, weather can change. You can get up and the weather could be less than what the reports were. And you can turn around and, uh, and uh, you will, um, um, you can turn, turn around and come back in. You can just say in flight, hey, the weather's deteriorating. This is not whether I feel comfortable continuing in. I want to discontinue. That's the key word. I want to discontinue. Um, but generally, I'm going to sit back, let you make the weather decision. Now, I might say, hey, somebody just came back in from blind. You want to go get a pilot report? Things like that. Um, you know, why don't you walk outside, take a look outside, um, just so you're, you're really assessing it from every angle. Um, now, I often tell the tell, uh, applicant, uh, uh, you know, I cannot get involved, but your instructor can. If your instructor is saying, do you really think you should go? Maybe you shouldn't go. Um, that uh, the instructor can absolutely influence you. I cannot. All right. So then we say, are any questions at that point? So do you have any questions at this point about the what we're talking about in this pre-flight briefing? Anyone? Let me know you're still there. Still here, no question. Still here, no question. <laughs> I'm still you here, no question. Understand. I had, I, I had a, a class I was running for instructors last week, and <laughs> we had to re we, we, the connection dropped. We had to restart three times, and you know, I would it, eventually I'd get a, a, a text seventy six hundred loss of communication or something like that. I realized, oh, uh, we, 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 uh, we had a technical glitch. Okay, so we're talking about the private pilot first. And so we're going to kind of start off with where the flight would start in the takeoffs. Here are some what I would call common errors I see. Now, not every one of these errors is absolutely uh, without, not within standards, and that's why we're going to review the standards at the end, but these are just things that I see. Um, doesn't use sufficient or correct crosswind corrections on takeoff roll. That it's, it's not thought of until we break ground, all of a sudden we start drifting and people start compensating for the wind. Um, a takeoff roll in a crosswind starts in a crosswind taxi ailerons pointed into the wind reducing ailerons until we break ground and we end up in in the wind correction angle um, doesn't track the extended center line after liftoff they do a great job of compensating for crosswinds on takeoff but then once they're airborne they don't pay attention to their ground track and we drift off center line we're going to look at the acs here in a minute what it says about that um, short field takeoff doesn't compensate for the left turning tendencies on takeoff mm -hmm. because you're starting from a dead stop at a higher RPM. It always wants to veer to the left and failing to compensate for that promptly can result getting off center line, which would be a reason uh, uh, for notice disapproval. And we'll be looking at those standards here in a second as well. Soft field takeoff, uh, one of the most common things I see is they don't get the nose wheel off the ground during the takeoff roll. Uh, they think they do, but in reality, the, 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 the nose wheel is still on the runway and it's supposed to be uh, nose off and then accelerate and, let, and lift the airplane off at a slower speed than rotation and then lower the nose, accelerate into ground while we're in ground effect. That's where the next problem normally occurs. Um, doesn't maintain a side slip while in ground effect. The reason that we want that is if for some reason the airplane does settle back into the ground, the wheels uh, are aligned with the runway and you're not touching down side loaded. Um, so that's just a safety thing that uh, is not necessarily uh, an, an absolute an ACS, but it is one of the things that is an added safety factor. So now, I want to go look at the ACS, so I'm going to hop out of this and into this. And so we're looking for uh, takeoffs and landings. Okay, so normal takeoff. I'll blow this up so it's easy to see. Obviously, we're looking for checklists. We're looking for radio calls. Those are usually pretty well done. Um, Position flight controls for existing wind. That's what I was talking about earlier. We have a lot of times where people are not, even if it's a, because it's just a light wind, they don't put any correction in. Uh, even in some strong winds, because it's not their habit, they don't put corrections in. That's where we have a problem. Clear the area, taxiing to take a position, line the airplane or runway center line, and, uh, and 
uh, take off power, flooding instruments prior to rotation, avoid excessive water spray for the sea. We don't care about that. Rotate and lift off, recommend time speed. Um, establish pitch attitude, maintain air speed. Uh, notice it says here maintain directional control and proper wind correction throughout takeoff and climb. That's what we're talking about uh, tracking the center line, the extended center line uh, on takeoff. So that's where, um, where the standard says it is to be. Um, okay. Most of the time, I can't think of uh, a time where a takeoff was so bad that um, it was, well, no, that's not true. I have had issues where the takeoff was so bad that I had to take the controls and, uh, and the flight test ended right there. Um, overcompensating on the rotation, uh, pulled up excessively um, on a, on a, um, uh, on a, uh, um, a soft field takeoff and you know we're passing about 50 feet and dropping below 50 knots okay time to take over um that was actually person knew better not to do that that was more intention of uh they they were nervous and muscle tension uh caused them to overcompensate and uh and so that's that's something that if you get into the diego videos he talks about uh, about that all right so, um, any questions on the takeoff so far? All right. I just want to pop back here for a second. Um, it's okay if you do sit with your microphones open and you can ask questions a little bit easier that way, unless you got some noise in the background. The only reason you should go ahead and have your, have your microphone closed or off in that situation. It just makes it a little bit easier. So I just want to see who all was signed on and get a number for tonight. All right, so we'll go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so where do we go after takeoff? We go and we depart on cross country to plan for your flight test. This is where um, one of the most recent things you learned in the training process were cross countries. Um, but lots of little errors can occur here that affect the overall outcome, like fails to note time uh, at takeoff, because that's going to affect your nav log, that's going to affect uh, the next item fails to open flight plan. If you don't know your takeoff time, how can you tell flight service what your takeoff time was? Uh, not to mention it's going to affect your uh, uh, pilotage and dead reckoning, figuring out what time you're supposed to be doing at the, the next checkpoint. Um, does it effectively use nav log to track fuel consumptions? Bottom line is why do you use a nav log? It's to manage your fuel, to make sure you have enough fuel to get where you need to go. Um, the uh, next one is can't show the calculations for an accurate ground speed. I can't tell you how many times I say, what's your actual ground speed? Yes, you have a GPS that can tell you your actual ground speed, but we are, we are uh, uh, wanting to see your dead reckoning skills at work. So we want to see you take time over a, uh, a, a, a two ground points. So the, the time between two ground checkpoints, the distance between those two checkpoints and calculate ground speed. There's a function in your E6B for that. And that's what we want to see you do is that you understand the concept. Um, the other thing is that, that we've, we've had problems with people misidentifying or just missing their visual checkpoints. Most of the times um, they think that they're looking for the checkpoint in the wrong place. When they see something that looks kind of like it and they'll misidentify it. Or they just miss the visual checkpoint because it's, it was supposed to be on their side of the airplane but it's on my side of the airplane and it's, it's literally just barely off my side of the airplane in a blind spot. They can't see it, but they just keep flying along. 
you know, and in, 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 you know, maybe they get lucky and find the next checkpoint or maybe not. Um, that, uh, it, it, it's, it's really one of those things of, uh, Always remember that you, 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 your airplane's not an invisible jet. You have to be able to you know, move or maneuver around sometimes to, to see the checkpoint. If you, don't, if you think you know where you're at, but it just doesn't quite look right, do a 360, look at the whole area. Do a 360 to your side of the airplane so it's easier to see the whole area. You'll eventually see that checkpoint that was on my side. Yeah, it'll take a little bit longer, but it shows that you 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 are doing every you can, thing you can to find that checkpoint. Diversions, common errors, fails to com comprehend the diversion scenario. Once again, we're supposed to be doing scenario training. We came up with this cross country scenario, um, you know, and uh, one of the one of the most favorable things is uh, a weather diversion, and uh, you know, it, it previously it was harder to do than it is today. I'm going to change this over to a VFR chart, and I'm going to throw a root in. So we're going KRL to KOCF. We just passed uh, Orlando Apopka right here, and we say, "Well, it looks like there's some weather in front. It's extending." Uh, just this side of Leesburg, all the way around, like this. This is where the bad area is. Where do you want to go? They forget to look down here at any airports. Um, they always say, well, I'll go back to executive. Not a bad idea. Can they use executive as a diversion point? Absolutely. A lot of times they just want to go right here. Um, well, they're private airports. And, or they're the you know they want to go back to Orlando and Popka. Well, it's kind of hard to do the diversion procedure going back there and see if they can actually do that. So we will a lot of times say, well, you can't use those because they're closed or something like that. So they have to pick something a little farther away. But it amazes me how even when I draw a picture like this, they can't even think about okay, well, what about the semi? What about you know um, is there something down here that looks good? You know, Winter Haven or something like that. You know, we try to draw a scenario where there's some options, you know, um, you know, I might draw it where the, the line of weather's like here and, you know, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, Brooksville, um, that's, that's an option or, um, or um, something along, the, along those lines. Um, so um, that, that's one of the challenges. Now we don't, it's not always going to be a scenario like weather. Um, that's one of our options. We can come up with any kind of scenario. We can say, okay, you, if we talked last week in the system section about if we have a little oil pressure indicator. And, you know, so you've got a little oil pressure indicator, but your oil pressure is fine. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to head back to executive. Good call. Go ahead and execute that. And uh, um, that, uh, that would be, or you know, I'm going to head into Leesburg. Okay, good call. Let's go ahead and execute that. Um, and so the scenarios can be many, many, many things um, that it could be passenger discomfort um, that uh, I'm not feeling well. I need to, I need to, you know, get on the ground right, right now or I'm going to throw up. Um, you know, so now we've got some, some stressors and some pressures. Now in that instance, Orlando Apopka might be a great alternative, um, you know, that, that type of thing. So that that's where we, we have to create a scenario that the, the applicant's going to have to do some thinking on. Okay. Um, fails to compensate for actual or forecast wind conditions. So they pick a direction and they turn in that direction, which is just a rough estimate, but then they forget about the north wind at 40 knots and it causes them to, to track the course um, to the wrong side. They can actually miss uh, the, uh, the, the diversion airport. Now, um, sometimes you'll go all the way to diversion airport. Sometimes it'll just be a validation with use of say GPS, uh, or VOR to get there. But, uh, um, that I have had scenarios where we've, we, the airport was very close to us and they couldn't find it, even though it was on, on the map and on the GPS, they couldn't find it because they didn't know what they're looking for. Well, probably because, when they picked it, they picked something like this. 
How many people know right where Bob White is? The grass field. Is it easy? No, I have no idea where that is. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to see, but I mean, if you've been in the North Shore of Lake Apopka, you've flown over it many times. Um, in relation to Orlando Apopka, you know, it's literally just down the road, follow the railroad tracks, um, and it goes right by it. Um, but because it's grass, it's not as easy to see. And what I tell people is if you're trying to find an airport, whether it be paved or grass, look for white buildings because most hangars are white and they're large buildings to hang your airplanes. So it's usually easier to spot a hangar than it is to spot the actual airport initially. Um, if you've been up to um, um, Umatilla, we see the buildings and the lakes around it way before we see the runway. Um, it's only a 2,500 foot, 50 foot wide runway. So it's, it doesn't jump out at you like executive does. Um, so that's, that's one of those things that, uh, um, that also cause people problems on diversions when they pick something like that. Now, can they pick a private use airport as a diversion airport? Absolutely. We want them to be trying, you know, in the emergency, Absolutely. Now, what's the reason for the diversion? Passenger discomfort, probably not a good idea. Uh, you know, oil pressure low. Yeah, that's a good, good place to go. Even if it's just a low oil pressure indication, um, you probably should try to pick a, a public use airport. Um, but, you know, once again, are there enough of, of around that you could get there in a reasonable amount of time? So it's kind of like there's no real wrong answer to that one as far as picking a private use airport or a not private use airport when it comes comes down to it, which it does matter. Safety's first, exact as is is the mantra. So, all right, let's go back to the presentation. Um, okay, so I want to go in and look at the ACS on this. I should have just stayed in four flight. So. So navigation really comes down to pilotage, dead reckoning, navigation systems radar, so that's electronics, then diversion. So I'm going to look at pilotage and dead reckoning um, and look at some of those uh, standards that we're talking about. Navigation by pilotage, that means finding physical points on the ground, identifying them, and saying, I'm here on the map. Notice it says prepare and use a flight log. Does that flight log have to be paper? Um, no. According to the FAA, it can be electronic as well. Um, we do choose to use the paper nav log, even though some of the information is digitally generated, just because we want you to understand as a school how that's done so that if, if you can understand what the, the later on the uh, four flight does for you. Uh, navigate by means of pre-computed headings, ground speeds, and elapsed time. That's the dead reckoning. And that's where we're talking about figuring out ground speed calculations and the actual lapse time because that's going to affect your fuel, which is uh, um, uh, really the main reason why we do any flight planning calculations is to make sure we run out of, we don't run out of fuel. It is, in my opinion, completely avoidable. You hear about it, however, what the number one cause of an off-airport landing is fuel starvation. How can that happen? That can happen by poor planning. Not knowing what your fuel burn is, not knowing what your time is, not knowing the quantities you had when you took off, poor pre-flight planning, poor pre-flight of the aircraft. Um, all things lead up to the same same issue. So that's why we pay a lot of attention to those calculations in the flight test is we want to see if you're going to relate that to the fuel burn and say, oh, well, it looks like I'm slower. So that means I'm going to use more fuel. So when we get into the version, there's actually even questions about uh, do we have enough fuel to get there? But even that, in, even here in the, uh, in the uh, uh, normal procedures, that there is as well. So here, let's talk about the diversion. Um, so Selects a suitable destination, makes a reasonable estimate of heading, ground speed, arrival time, and fuel consumption to the diverted airport. Not very specific. We have written some additional procedures to specify that for you. If you follow the diversion procedure checklist, you will always get it right. 
Um, notice the altitude in, is, is plus or minus 200, heading is plus or minus 15 on the heading. Um, update your weather, use uh, uh, flight deck displays with digital and aeronautical information as applicable. Um, that it does not specify in here to um, notify flight service. We add that step because flight service is there to, to uh, find you or start somebody looking for you if you don't get what you need, where you need to go. Um, and uh, a lot of people say, well, I'll use flight follow. Guess what? If you fail to check in with flight following or if you fail to respond to the controller on flight following, he'll just think you changed frequency. They're not going to send anybody looking for you. So that's why we have the company policy of using a flight plan anytime we're going over 50 nautical miles filed with uh, flight service open, activated, and canceled. Also, you add the fact that, hey, guess what? Electronically, as long as we have digital connection at the runway, we can open our flight plan, whether it be with uh, um, for flight or with uh, 1-800-WX-BRIEF.COM. Um, that, uh, you know, it makes it easier than it ever has been. We don't have to call them on the radio to open and activate the flight plan. Uh, I also believe that you don't close a flight plan until you're on the ground at your destination. A lot of people would call five miles out saying, yeah, I got the airport in sight, and they never make it to the airport, and, and nobody's looking for them because the flight plan got closed. Tower doesn't know you're coming in there, or if it's a non-tower airport, nobody knows you're coming in there. So that's why it's important to open, activate, or file open and activate the flight plan. Okay. Stalls. Who loves them? Everyone. <laughs> okay. Stalls are, you know, it, 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 you wouldn't be normal if you weren't a little apprehensive about a stall. Okay, we're, we're, we're taking the airplane up and we're reducing the, the or increasing the angle of attack and, and reducing the lift produced. And, um, you know, when you, when you think about it, it's like, hmm, why are we even doing that? It's because, well, one, when we come in and land, we're doing that exact same thing. Uh, and as we're f approaching the airport, we're getting close to that. And we want to know how the airplane handles in that situation when it's, we're up at a safe altitude. Um, and that's why as you go through flying as a, as a private pilot or, or above, every new airplane you get into, guess what? We're going to be doing stalls um, that, uh, um, that even, even jet aircraft, they're going to be practicing especially high altitude stalls because characteristics are different. Um, so it is something that as, as, as a pilot, we don't want to become casual about but and we want to have a healthy respect for them but we also want to be able to be comfortable and relaxed enough to execute them most of the times when i see problems with stalls on the flight test it's because people are scared of them you know doesn't establish a sufficient descent into the entry because the acs says we got to establish a descent because we're simulating an approach to the landing stall so we want to be in a descent configuration but if somebody's nervous they rush to get in and out of the stall so they don't have to do it again. Uh, they pitch up too much and too quickly to this stall. Same reason. Um, a power off stall is a gradual maneuver. It's simulating that we've lost the engine and we're trying to stretch our glide to the runway in the landing configuration. Um, and uh, so it's a gradual approach to the stall and, uh, and uh, the nose attitude may, may get above the horizon, but not much more than and you know five six seven maybe nine degrees it's uh I, but what i've seen people doing in a power off stall is a 20 degree nose up attitude um because they they're they're pulling back quickly into that into that configuration and uh and so that that's something that needs to be avoided uh a lot of times they recover before they actually reach the full stall in the private it is specifying that uh, it is a full stallers in the commercial. We have an option. Um, and so um, that they, they think they're there, but they're not there. Why? Because they're afraid. Um, stalls, um, excuse me, I got dogs barking outside. 
that uh, um, so um, does not exit the maneuver with the VY climb. This is probably the most common error I see everywhere. That if you do, and we're going to look at the ACS, it says exit to maneuver in a VY climb. Um, the goal is to return to your altitude. The idea is we did a stall at a low altitude. We're simulating an approach to land and stall. We need to climb and get away from the ground, give ourselves more margin for error. Um, it's not comfortable. Uh, a lot of people are not comfortable with uh, stalls on a turn. If I say I want a power off stall in landing configuration with a left 20 degree bank, you will not believe how big somebody's eyes get. They're like, oh, I've never done that before. Well, it's, it's and, and if that has happened, it's the instructor's fault that they did not do it with you enough. They may have done it once or twice because the curriculum called for it, but they are not comfortable with it. So they don't like to do it. Everybody that, you know, that if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're afraid of a stall and they tell me because I'm going to go into a spin if I stall and turn, they obviously don't know, understand the aerodynamics behind it, that a coordinated uh, turning stall is, is no different in, in, than a, uh, um, a coordinated stall in, uh, in, in uh, straight ahead. And so um, that's usually a item that when I ask for it, I, I do get a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, um, um, the, the, the applicant gets tense, but I'm going to show you the ACS where it tells me I can, so you should be ready for it. All right, power on stalls, um, not pulling the ailerons neutral in recovery because of the wing drop, the natural reaction, wing drops to the, to the left, the actual reaction is putting ailerons to the right, but that can aggravate the, uh, the stall and, 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 and actually um, uh, lead to, 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 uh, to the spin. So, you know, locking those wrists in is important. Recovers with, before a full stall is reached because they're, once again, nervous of, about it. This is a much different pitch attitude. This is a 20 degree pitch up attitude um, that you think you're the space shuttle going into space because you think you're pointing straight at the sky. But if you ever watch one from outside the airplane, it's not as drastic as it thinks. And part of the reason is we slow it down to rotation speed before we start to maneuver so that we're simulating a stall at a low altitude on takeoff. And that's why they need to make sure that they exit the maneuver in that VY climb. But what happens is you inevitably stall at an altitude higher than you started, and you're like, oh, I gotta maintain an altitude. When we read the ACS, you're gonna see that that's not the case, that they do not expect you to level off at the same altitude you started at. Um, and like I say, it, uh, once again, if I, if, if I ask somebody to do a, a power on stall in a left turn, 20 degree bank angle, um, I'm, I'm sure their, their uh, tension in their body would go up. Bottom line is that's a very common uh, stall spin scenario is in a turn, in a, in a, in a over pitching in situation where you're approaching a, um, a, uh, um, a power on stall. And so does it need to be practiced? Absolutely. Yes. It needs to be practiced. Is it something that's going to be asked for on the test? It may. So that's where I want to jump back to our ACS on that one. Is a wind drop okay in a power on stall as long as you recover it correctly? Yes. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it, the bottom line is, you know, uh, wing drops, you know, you, 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 you're really dealing with the stall first and then you're keeping your ailerons neutral and using your rudder to bring your wings left back right. level. It's not a spin entry uh, per se, you know, but it, it, it is the beginning of, of one. And as long as you stop it, you at the correct maneuver you being you know not using anyone using rudder as well as breaking the stall you will not have a problem i have been on progress checks put into spins at the end of course um in the power on stall because people didn't take action when the wind dropped oh no so. ed do you only pick one stall for the for the check ride no you have to do both a power on and a power off stall it does okay. not give you an option. There are some things when you look at the ACS, and I'm going to flip to that um, right now. Um, phew, come on. There we go. Um, for example, right here in ground reference maneuvers, um, it, 
it tells me I've got to pick one of the three ground maneuvers. So that's a place I have a latitude to select things. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but when you come to stalls, you'll notice it doesn't give me the option. I have to do every, every, every task. So I've got to do slow flight. I've got to do stalls. Um, and first power off, or I can do power on first, but they're separate tasks, so they cannot be combined. Um, so looking at, once again, I, I've been going to the skills section because the rest of it is really knowledge. And like you say, those are questions that we're gonna be asking either uh, subjects like that might be stuff that I'm gonna ask while we're approaching the stall or after the stall's done or when we're in the, in the ground portion, when we're talking about the knowledge areas and the risk management areas. Um, so that's when we say we're gonna continue to ask questions. Um, so, so here it says in, in, in uh, item S6, maintains a specified heading plus minus 10 degrees if in straight flight. Maintains a specified bank angle not to exceed 20 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees if in turning flight while inducing the stall. So right there, and the, the, the wording is going to be exactly the same in, in the power on stall. That's where we say, okay, 20 degree bank to the left, power off stall landing configuration. Um, because honestly, that's where it's going to happen is that base to final, um, turn in the traffic pattern. We want you to, to see that you can control the airplane at the slower speeds there. And so, um, that's why, you know, uh, I don't think instructors in general do turning stalls enough because applicants never seem to be comfortable with it or never seem to be, um, minutely confident in it. Um, usually I'll hear the first words and the first thing they do is throw the instructor under the bus. My instructor never made me do that. <laughs> you know, and as an instructor, yeah, let me look at your logbook. Yeah. Power off stalls left turn. That's why it's important for instructors to write things in the logbook of the customer to be exactly what you did so that when they say, I never did that. Well, yeah, you did see on this date, I recorded it. Um, okay. Um, So they acknowledge the stall and then they recover after a full stall occurs. So it says acknowledge the impending stall and then recover promptly after full stall. Whereas in the commercial, we can choose to do an impending stall. So what is an impending stall? First physical indication of a stall, whether that be the buffet or the horn, or I should say first indication of a stall, whether it be the buffet or the horn. Now in the Cessna, the, the, the buffet is very closely followed by the the full stall or the break. Um, and so that is uh, uh, sometimes harder to detect. Um, but basically say, okay, there's the horn, okay, there's the buffet, and then the full stall occurs, then you execute the recovery. And then here in S9, configure the airplane as recommended by the manufacturer and accelerate to VX or VY. Return to the altitude heading and airspeed specified by the evaluator not the airport, the altitude you began at. Now, of course, this is the power off stall we've already established up here. Uh, it talks about in um, um, uh, S4, it talks about est establish a stabilized descent. Too many people do not take the time to establish the descent. I, I've heard people set up the descent and say one, two, three, and then stall. We need to, we need to make sure we've got momentum going downward. Why are we doing that? Well, what we're doing is we're changing the relative wind. We're changing uh, the flight path of the airport airplane, which of course the relative wind is opposite of that. Relative wind, cord line, angle of attack, critical angle of attack. So we're, we're, we're establishing that we can stall the airplane in a descent. We don't have to be in a nose high attitude to do it. Um, and, and so that's, that's critical. And that's why when you look at our standard operating procedures, we specify more than 100 feet of altitude loss before we attempt uh, to stall. So we have that, 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 uh, that flight path established. Um, let's see. So transition smoothly in an S5 from the approach or landing attitude to a pitch attitude that will induce a stall. Smoothly, not abruptly, not quickly, 
smoothly. And it's like, um, once again, if somebody's doing that, I can tell they're apprehensive about it. They're scared of it. They don't need to be, they need to respect it, but they don't need to be scared of it. This is going to be a little bit more of a routine maneuver if they have practiced it enough. All right, so the power on, you can see that the um, difference here is, uh, you know, established takeoff departure cruise configuration is specified by the examiner. So uh, in a 172, the takeoff is clean in, in, you know, in most cases other than the, the short or the soft. So, you know, the takeoff departure configuration are basically the same. Uh, cruise configuration is basically the same. Um, and so we're looking at the, um, um, you know, how do we, how do we get this set up? Um, set power as signed by the evaluator, no less than 65%. That's after we've slowed the airplane down. So when we talk about established takeoff uh, departure or cruise configuration and maintain coordinate throughout the maneuver, they're talking about let's slow it down to takeoff and departure speeds and configuration. So when you say the word configuration, it's a combination of all of those. That's why we slow it down to the uh, departure, the spark, the shimmy, the uh, rotation speed before we begin this maneuver. Also realize that these maneuvers are outlined for you, uh, not just in our SOPs, but in uh, the airplane flying handbook, um, which is one of the documents listed up here. Um, and um, I'm not sure exactly, I think it's 8083.3. Um, and so that, uh, that that's also where we're driving some of those procedures from. So in, in by, by the FAA putting that reference up there, that is the way I will expect you to do the maneuver. Um, basically, it expands on what we see here in the, in the skills section. Um, so when in doubt, we refer back to that, unless the manufacturer has a differing procedure, which we will, we will talk a little bit about when we get into landings. Okay, um, there was a point I was going to make here. Notice it says sets powers as assigned by the evaluator to no less than 65% power. Now, generally, I'm not specifying anything. I ask you in the briefing. So when you're doing a power on stall, what power setting do you use? Most of the time in a, in a, in a fixed pitch uh, piston single, we're going to use full power. Whereas if we're a high performance airplane like the Bonanza or, um, or a Cessna 210 um, uh, or even a Cessna 182, we will probably do a reduced power setting for this so it's not as a drastic of a nose up attitude to get the stall to occur. But once again, I will really leave that up to the schools that I, that wherever the, the person's training at, you know, whatever procedure they use, I'm just gonna ask about it in the pre-flight so I know what to expect. Um, and then of course here it says, transition smoothly from takeoff to departure attitude to uh, pitch attitude to reduce the stall. Now, what's interesting is people that pitch up drastically in the, in the, in the power off stall do not pitch up drastically in the um, power on stall. Because if they did, they'd be climbing like a banshee and that scares them too. So um, that, that's usually why I say, you know, that was the way the power off stall was supposed to be entered. You know, nice and gently like that. Um, so then talks about uh, turning flight again, 20 degrees bank, plus or minus 10, if in turning flight. So we can ask for that stall in a turn as well. And basically acknowledge the cues of the impending stall, then recovers after the full stall. So once again, the private is actually, in my opinion, tougher than the commercial because we have to go to a full stall. And then executes a recovery. Then it says configure the airplane at the X or VY as appropriate. Return to the altitude heading and airspeed specified by the evaluator. So what I have started doing, I learned my lesson. I don't wait to see if they it set the VY attitude. Um, I tell them before we enter the maneuver, da, 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 and upon recovery, let's end up at 3,000 feet, some number higher than we're at. So they're already in their head. I've got to climb up to that altitude. So I'm, I'm starting to, I've started to specify that before the maneuver begins. They will never they forget about it. And I might have to remind them about, okay, what altitude we climb to? Oh yeah. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but in, 
inevitably the, the habit just needs to be, and this is why we want it this way, the habit needs to be if you inadvertently got into a stall to recover and end up in a VY, in a VY climb. And uh, even if you were at 5,000 feet, a VY climb is not a bad place to be. So that's why, why we, we emphasize that. And like I say, we're not, we're not seeing it across the board. Um, and that's where it's just every stall recovery is in a VY climb. That's how it ends. All right. All right. I need some water. Moving along, steep turns. Um, common errors does not use visual reference point to roll in and roll out. They use a heading on their heading indicator and not a visual point outside the airplane. If you read the airplane flying handbook, um, it, it discusses that. You read the uh, SOPs, we talk about it as well. Does not use the outside sight picture. I can't tell you how many times after a steep turn, I've told somebody, you're going to make a great instrument pilot. Problem is you're taking a VFR flight test today. Um, that fixating on the attitude indicator um, might get you into those standards, but generally it causes more deviations than it does um, if you just look outside and are familiar with the bank angle and the pitch attitude you need to maintain. Another huge problem in this is poor coordination during the roll and in the turn. When you're rolling into a steep turn, uh, it takes a pretty aggressive rudder to, uh, to cause the nose to pivot on the uh, longitudinal axis, but you are supposed to see the airplane pivot, you establish the bank angle, and then the turn begins. Once the turn begins, it actually takes, if everything else is, is set up correctly, a little bit of rudder in the direction of the turn to maintain coordination. If you don't do that, you'll actually find out that um, it's a little bit easier on the back pressure, um, that you don't have to hold as much back pressure when you, when, you, when you don't use your rudder correctly, but it's gonna be very clearly uncoordinated and obviously you need to stay coordinated. So then you push the rudder in because you see, oh, I'm not coordinated, it saves a, 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 a left turn. So you step on left rudder, guess what happens to the nose? Anybody wanna tell me what happens to the nose when I step on the left rudder in a 45 degree bank? What was that? That was down. Down. Okay, because yeah, that some somebody was talking that was really muffled. Um, yes, the nose is going to pitch down um, because at forty-five degrees, the rudder is also acting a little bit like an elevator, and that's when you add that back pressure that we always talk about. Now, do you have to use trim in a steep turn? Um, no, you don't have to use trim in the steep turn. However, the people that use trim in the steep turn generally will execute it better and more consistent. Um, that's a, a something that we teach somebody to help give them the technique they need to, to manage that, uh, that, uh, that uh, um, um, pitching moment uh, at that time. If we see excessive altitude variations, it's usually because they're, they're, they're not trimming and they're fighting the controls. Um, and then uh, failure to maintain proper bank angle. Um, even if they're looking inside, I see them failing to maintain proper bank angle. The nice thing about the, the G1000, it gets us, gives us a 45 degree mark. Back in the day, we had the standard gauges. You look at your standby instrument. There's no mark at 45. You had to guess where 45 was. So here you have a mark saying this is 45. You also need to be very familiar with the, the picture outside the airplane of what the bank angle looks like so you know you're there so you don't have to look in at the instrument entirely throughout the maneuver. Um, but quite often we see people on a too shallow of a bank. Why? Because they're not comfortable with going into a steeper bank because they didn't practice it enough. So take a look at the ACS on this one. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, speed control is important. A lot of times I ask people, what's your reference speed? 
and they like uh, 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 they look at the airspeed indicator. They tell me whatever it is. Well, if I've asked that question, it's probably because it's not the same as when we started maneuvering. Um, but basically, establish manufacturer speed, or if one's not been available, um, the airspeed not to ex uh, an airspeed not to ex exceed VA. So it doesn't have to be VA. They just have to say, okay, 95 knots. And that's what we do. We, we take our normal cruise speed at, at our, our practice RPM and say, that's our target speed. It's because we have to maintain that plus or minus 10 knots. If we're not maintaining that speed, that means we didn't add enough power and, uh, in, when, when entering the maneuver. Um, once again, it says, rolls into a coordinated 360 degree current turn uh, with approximately 45 degree bank. Then it says perform the task in the opposite direction as specified by the evaluator. I don't have to see the turn in both directions. We do practice it that way a lot. I can ask for that, but I don't have to see that. A lot of times it is, I ask for one in the right direction or, or the left direction. I tell you to pick your own. And then if, if, if things were a little wonky in the first one that was kind of marginal, I'll say, okay, well, give me one to the right, you know, if you pick the left and see if that's any better. Um, you know, so I have the discretion there to do or not to do. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, so just realize that you don't have to do the 360 one way and the 360 other way. However, we do practice it that way. We do our use our SOP and specify that way. Um, now, you know, it gives you all these numbers here, 100 feet, 10 knots, five angles, five degrees, heading, entry, 10 degrees. So that I understand why people want to look at the instruments, but to consistently do this maneuver, you, you pick the outside reference, you get a good understanding of your visual picture, and you make the control movements that you need to make by looking outside the airplane. And that is the only way to get, get consistently good with it. And, uh, um, and it's, it's the difference of being within 50 feet of your altitude or, or, or marginally within your 100 feet. You, you can nail it inside 50 feet every time if you're looking outside the window. Um, a lot of times what I will do in a teaching process of that is I will cover the flight instrument, instruments and make people do steep turns without any instruments. They know they gotta add a little power, they know they gotta add a little trim, they don't need to look inside to do that. And then as we're going through the turn, I'll, you know, I'll cover it with a towel, I'll lift the towel up, and let them take a look and take a glimpse and see, oh, wow, I'm right on. You know, and they, they have to, you know, they roll, roll through the whole maneuver, roll out, and then I lift them up, and they find that they're on the exact same altitude they started with and on the proper heading because they were looking outside. So that is one of the things that, that I do talk with the staff about doing in a way to, to teach that maneuver better. Um, that uh, you're relying on the flight instruments, it will be showing all the common errors. So it's, it, I mean, we know when you're looking at the instruments. Um, now, ultimately, if it's within these numbers on the flight test, I cannot say anything and won't. Now, progress check. If it's not using the right technique, we will say something and try to correct it because we know in the long run that's what we need to do. All right. Um, let's see where we're at here. Oh, wow. I got two slides on that. That's doubly important. All right, emergencies. Um, emergency scent is a common, commonly misunderstood maneuver. Most of the time, people are unsure of the purpose of the maneuver. And it does have a couple different meanings to it. So when I say, okay, we want to do the emergency scent. Now that is the one that is a rapid loss of altitude for some reason it is not an engine failure. Could it be an engine fire? Yes, but there's also a specific checklist procedure in, in, in the uh, operations or the uh, POH about an engine fire that is not specifically using the emergency descent procedure. Um, and so I usually say this is an example of, you know, we've got to get on the ground quick because there's, there's smoke <laughs> um, or something of that nature, or there's a, a medical emergency um, obviously, commercial, it's easy because I just say cabin depressurization. We're flying a pressurized airplane today, cabin depressurization. So, you know, we've got to set up the scenario. But um, so the, the, you need to understand what it can and will be used for. Uh, it was not a maneuver that was in the PTS 
uh, um, uh, early on. Uh, in fact, it was only added within the past 10, 15 years. Um, they, they tried to make the private a lot like the commercial and, you know, in the commercial, it made sense. It made sense. These people are going to be flying high performance airplanes. They need to know how to do emergency descents in case they're flying a pressurized airplane. That made sense. But putting in the private, not sure exactly why they did it, but it's not mine to ask why. Mine's just to test you on it. Um, a lot of times people are confused with the proper procedure uh, because there's not a lot of text on it. Uh, because it is still relatively new procedure. There is uh, a very vague uh, discussion of it in the airplane flying handbook. Um, and then when you read ACS, it can be interpreted um, um, one of a couple ways. Um, the most common thing and most important thing when executing the maneuver is you don't want to have uh, your passengers floating in the, in the cockpit. So you do not want to have negative Gs. You need to get a positive G loading. One of the techniques to do that is put the airplane in a 45 degree uh, angle bank while the nose, that, that allows the nose to pitch down quickly to the attitude you want for the descent without causing somebody to float up in their seat. As Soon as you get the pitch down that you want, then you roll the wings out, you're straight and level, and now you're in a steep descent. Then it talks about slight turns left or right to clear your blind spot as you're coming down. 23, 30 degree bank, one way, 20, 30 degree bank the other way. That is just to see in front of you because that nose is blocking where you're going at that rate. Uh, you're, you're descending into your blind spot. Um, the uh, most common error, however, is airspeed tolerance. Um, when, you, when we read the ACS, you'll see that it is um, plus zero minus 10 from your target airspeed. Um, and uh, when, when we look at what the target airspeed is, that's what can vary. It doesn't really specify. In either um, um, the uh, airplane flying handbook or in the um, um, ACS. And there is no pH, POH procedure for it either. So that's where the, the general interpretation is uh, in a retractable gear airplane is we put the gear down because we want the drag to help us descend and then we take it up to our maximum speed that we can operate with the gear in the down position. Um, with regard to a, um, a single engine airplane that has fixed gear, we generally use the um, um, maximum structural cruising speed VNO. Um, and, uh, but if a school chooses to write a procedure and says, okay, VNO is 130, we're going to do it 125. So 125 is our target number, then that has to be um, plus zero minus 10. And so that's, that's where, where that, um, that uh, um, will come from. And we'll look at the ACS here in a second. Um, simulated engine failures. Um, common errors, poor or no use of checklists. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about the print helmet, Dakota. Dog just walked in. Um, that there's there's no um, um, no picking up of checklist to verify anything. They're using only memory items, and uh, and you know that's that is one of those things that the the if you're if you're at a thousand feet, okay, you've got to do memory items, get them done first. You're not going to have time to pick up to use the checklist. But if we're doing it from thirty five hundred feet, there's time to do memory items followed by the checklist. So. Um, that's that's the type of stuff we're talking about now. Um, poor airspeed maintenance, generally because they don't trim. If you trim for your your best glide speed, it'll pretty much hold that glide speed, um, and you won't have as much uh, aircraft management to do on the way down. You can concentrate more on figuring out why the engine failed. Uh, poor landing area selection. Inevitably, people select a field that is too far for us to glide. And, uh, you know, it might be nice and big and wide, and, um, but inevitably they pick something that's too far to glide. They're not familiar with the gliding distance of the airplane or gliding characteristics of the airplane. Um, and then finally, uh, they select a good field um, and they, they just can't make it. They either overshoot or they undershoot. Either way, you didn't make the field. That's a bad day. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and those are, those are um, 
way too common. Now, one of the things that uh, I tell people in the in the pre-flight briefing for this, um, if you choose a private or public use airport when you choose your emergency landing area, I will expect you to land on that runway. If you choose a non-public use airport, I will have you take it down to 100 feet above the ground and I will call the go around. Because once again, it's a runway, we can make an approach to it. Yeah, we're not supposed to land there unless it's an emergency. And if for some reason the engine didn't come back up when we did a go around, we got a place to land. And then if it's a non, if it's a field other than a, uh, uh, a, an airport, just an open field, we will take it down to 500 feet AGL. And I will tell them that I'm the one that will call for the go around at 500 feet AGL. Um, that I don't expect them to to monitor that. Um, that it's my my issue with safety. Because let's put it this way: if that was a real engine failure, they should be landing the airplane. That's what we need to be. But I tell them they have to be in a position to actually make a landing on field, not undershoot it, not overshoot it. But basically, from 500 feet, I can see you're configured to land, and uh, and you'd be able to make that field. So let's go to ACS on this. I guess you're staying with me, Dakota. <laughs> um, so emergency descent. Clear the RTA area. Now this is a emergency maneuver, so it does have to be handled pretty quickly. Establish, maintain appropriate airspeed, configuration appropriate to scenarios specified by the evaluator, and as covered in POH uh, for emergency descent. Once again, most POHs do not have a uh, procedure for this. Uh, maintain in small airplanes. Maintain orientation, divide attention appropriately, plan and execute smooth recovery. Use bank angle between 30 and 45 degrees to maintain positive load factors during descent. So the bank angle they're talking about is the look is like I was talking about rolling in to a 30, 45 degree bank angle so, so the nose comes down without having a negative load factor or negative GC. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to have people floating in the cockpit, but not during this maneuver. Um, so the turns after that are simply for clearing the area and not really even mentioned in ACS. However, it does mention it some in the uh, airplane flying handbook. And then here it says maintain appropriate airspeed plus 10 minus zero. Uh, but notice it never specifies what that airspeed is. It says configuration, airspeed and configuration appropriate to the scenario. So if it is a fire in the cockpit, well, all of a sudden that becomes 100 knots or uh, engine fire, I'm sorry, engine fire, that becomes 100 knots. Although, if I'm an engine fire, I'd want it to be at 130 versus 100. Um, so um, that's where it gives us the latitude. If we give that scenario, then that number is right. But generally, once again, this is gonna be a discussion before we go fly about, okay, let's talk about that emergency sense. Some schools do it this way, some schools do it this way. How are you gonna do it today? So that I know what to expect, I know what to evaluate and how to evaluate it. because. You give me a number, I'm gonna maintain 130, then I've got to evaluate you minus, uh, uh, plus zero minus 10. So whatever that target number is, that's why I've got to know it. If I ask, what's your target airspeed? I don't know it. Same thing like with slow flight. People, people uh, I'm like, what's your target airspeed? I'm not gonna specify it for you uh, unless you give me something like 65. I said, well, why don't we try 55? You know, if it's way too fast, uh, they're not really getting the slow flight characteristics, but. Um, but generally, I'm going to ask them first, what do they normally do? All right. Emergency approach and landing simulated. Um, so, recommended glide speed plus or minus 10 knots. Configures airplane in accordance with the POH. AFM and existing conditions. Selects a suitable landing area considering altitude, wind, terrain, obstructions, and available glide distance. So here's that, selects a suitable landing area. And another common area is they completely forget about what the winds are doing that day. And they pick something and they're trying to land downwind. Um, that of course is going to make the area that you need to land in much longer. Sometimes, Picking the wind is the only way to, uh, in landing downwind, is the only way to get to that area. Once again, that goes back to available glide distance. So you do have the freedom to make a judgment decision like that, 
but most of the times it's not even considered. That would be where the problem would be. Um, plan and follow the flight path to a sector land area considered considering altitude, wind, direction, train, prepares for landing as specified by the evaluator. And that's where I can say if we're at a, if we're at a, uh, uh, if we're landing, a, if you pick a public use airport, you need to put it on the runway because that's prepare for landing as specified by evaluator. So that's where I've got that latitude. And of course, completes appropriate checklist. So it's pretty straightforward, but once again, if it's not practice, and we want this to be practice because in the event this really happens, um, you know, the statistical odds are, are low, but we want you to react appropriately. And what that, how that happens is by practice, practice, practice. And that's why we do so many of these in the training environment. All right, my voice needs a break. Let me grab some water here. All right. Okay, grammar for me. I only put up here two of them because, uh, let's face it, a rectangle, of course, is really hard to screw up. Uh, but, uh, um, but turns about a point or not. Um, uh, a lot of times, incorrect altitude. Uh, we're given in ACS an altitude of uh, 600 to 1,000 feet. Those are AGL altitudes. Um, and inevitably, people say 1,100 feet. Uh, which is a thousand feet AGL. But if you get off altitude by going up, you're outside of ACS standards. So that's why I recommend maybe picking 900 feet AGL because then that gives you a little bit of room up and a little bit of room down, but still gives you a nice comfortable altitude to do it at. I've actually been told 1500 feet. I've been told 2500 feet. Um, so, you know, that, that, uh, that was pretty clearly outside of standards. Uh, and they tried to execute it from there too. It was quite interesting. Um, so um, the other thing is they want to go find that special point. Wherever it is, they may not be near that point. But trust me, when I say I've picked a spot that there's plenty of, of, of points to use, you shouldn't have to go a long distance uh, to find a good spot to do turn about a point because you technically only need a few items there. Well, the other thing that I see a lot of times, and I actually track this on my floor flight, um, when wind direction is strong, uh, the ground check uh, ends up being oblong uh, and not equidistance. The turn about a point is supposed to be an equidistance turn around the center point. That means the radius of turn needs to be the same all the way around. And, and, and so the ground track on the ground, if it was plotted, which we now have the ability to do on fourth flight, needs to be a circle, not an egg. Uh, egg uh, egg shaped uh, um, uh, ground reference maneuvers are, 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 are indicative of, of not compensating correctly. We're supposed to use bank angle to compensate for the changing um, wind affecting the airplane, both drift and, and speed. And, uh, you know, we, we, when we're in the turn, we ask, okay, when's it your tail? What's your banking are supposed to be? Oh, it's supposed to be steepest. And you know, that's rope learning that, and everybody comes up with that answer. Um, but in reality, um, you have to have to set it up to where you're flying a nice circle. And the best way to do that, following the procedures we've established in the SOP, um, that, uh, try to have, uh, a center point and four points equidistance from the center point to kind of map your way around. You end up in a, in, and you end up actually adjusting bank. Up. And the reason they end up being oblong is the person is focused on the center point and they're trying to keep the center point in view. But in a strong wind condition, in a high wing airplane, you will have to be banking so steep that you will not be able to see that point, that center point. Uh, to keep yourself in that circular uh, ground track. And, and so that's why I say in a strong wind condition, we see this happening because they're, they're focusing on the center point and not the track on the ground. The track on the ground, that's why we call it ground reference maneuvers. As turn cross row, uh, weak areas there, wings are not in proper position at the midpoint. Uh, you're supposed to have the wings 
uh, over the road or parallel to the road and the few for, fuselage perpendicular to the road. Um, that's the toughest part of the maneuver is that roll through there. Uh, and then of course it's lack of coordination in the turns. Um, same thing that's true. I, I guess I didn't mention the coordinating the coordinations in the turns. A lot of times people get in the, the turn about a point and they're trying to use the run rudders to point at the point instead of concentrating on their ground reference and just keeping it coordinated. Obviously, we're at a low altitude. We want to be coordinated. Uh, we do not want to be uh, at a low altitude, a low airspeed, uncoordinated. Um, so those are those are the common areas. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at the ACS on that one. Um, so this is where it says we only have to pick one. Okay. Um, did I get the right one? No, let's see terms. It didn't look right. <laughs> so it says it. Plan the maneuver. The evaluator must select at least one maneuver for the applicant to demonstrate. Retain the course, enter left or right pattern, six to a thousand feet above the ground level, in an appropriate distance from the selected reference point, 45 degrees to the downward leg. So there you have to enter it on the 45 degrees and fly the rectangular course around the rectangle. Hard to find a good rectangle here in Florida. I grew up in Illinois. We had them all over the place. Uh, here, not so much. Um, turns about, or S turns uh, enter a perpendicular selected reference line. There it does say line, 600 to 1,000 feet at appropriate distance from the reference area. Then that talks about the turnabout point. Here it says turns around a point, enter an appropriate, enter at an appropriate distance from the reference point. And appropriate distance from the selected reference area. Um, and so I'll talk here a little bit about the wind drift. Apply adequate wind drift during straight and turning flight to maintain constant ground track around a rectangle reference area or to maintain a constant radius of turn on each side of the selected reference line or point. So they're really saying that radius of turn is also applying to the S turn as well. The S turn in my opinion is, is, is the turnabout point split in half made it and, and twisted to make an S. So it's really the same maneuver just with a little bit more turning. Um, and um, basically divide attention, look for traffic, uh, maintain coordinated flight, maintain altitude plus minus heat and heading uh, airspeeds by mean about 10, 10, degree, uh, 10 knots. So um, not a high percentage failure item, but those are, those are, are the, the common areas uh, that we see. And also realize I'm not saying these common areas are coming solely from our school. That's not the case. I'm seeing this. This is a discussion of what I see from all schools. Okay, we're coming into some of the last stuff for the private and it's some of the most important stuff and it's some of the most common failure areas. Um, we practice a lot of landings. Why? Because we need to get good at them. Why? Because the tolerances for the flight test are tight, but more importantly, um, to be accurate when we're flying, to be consistent when we're flying, to land where we're supposed to land. Um, you've all, if you've started landings already, you've all heard about aim point and touchdown point in the relationship. You've all heard about the stabilized approach. You can't make a good landing without a stabilized pro approach, and that stabilized approach terminates at the aim point. At the aim point, or just prior to the aim point, you're supposed to focus your eyes down the runway and land the airplane. Your eyes are not supposed to focus on the touchdown point ever. Can I say that again? Your eyes are never, ever supposed to focus on the touchdown point other than when you spot it on downwind. You select your touchdown point on downwind, you select your aim point on downwind, and then you look at aim point only. Once you're arriving at the aim point, it's time to bleed the speed off and land the airplane. Why do people touch down short? Why do people touch down long? Because they're looking at the touchdown point. I can't say that enough. Um, and you've got to, and it's why we teach it from the beginning in landings, even before we ever talk about a short field landing. Um, it's not used just on a short field landing. That's why on a, on a, on a phase five progress check, we're asking about the aim point. What's your aim point? What's your touching down point? Um, and when we hear aim point is a thousand, or we're touching down on a thousand foot markers and we're aiming at the 500 foot point, 
a 500 foot marker, if you actually use the 500 foot marker on that landing, we know on downwind, when you tell us those numbers, that you will be short of your point. We know that it's not gonna work unless there's just an outrageous amount of tailwind. And um, the touch the endpoint touchdown report relationship is is something that, that you have to have a good handle on. Um, and there's just a rough rule of thumb that we use five times your ground speed on final. If we're coming down final at 65, it's about 325, uh, 350. If you're coming down final at, uh, at um, um, 60, you know, five times 60 is 300. Um, you know, so that aim point will change in relation to the touchdown point uh, based on, on um, the wind. It will also tell you that all bets are off as soon as you're landing with a tailwind. And you've all experienced it executive because we always land with the tailwind and how much the airplane floats on landing. In that scenario, obviously not good for a test day if you're trying to touch down in a specified box. However, on a normal landing, you've got minus zero plus 400 feet. That's a lot of distance. I just want to go take a look at that. So everybody says, I'm going to touch down a thousand foot markers. And we've started asking instructors to teach touchdown on the 500 foot markers. And that's just to help ATC and make sure we can make the high speed taxiways. Oh, and by the way, the taxiway di uh, is uh, revamped down here at runway seven is done and open. Uh, so we don't have any of those uh, restrictions uh, um, that that is up and running. But let's say you say, I'm gonna touch down on the thousand foot markers. Okay, so I'm gonna put that there. Okay, and you say, okay, I'm gonna aim at uh, about 300 feet before, but you need to give me a specific spot that I can watch, because I need to see that you're actually approaching that spot. Now, 400 feet past, well, this is the five, or the uh, 1500 foot marker. So we got a touchdown before them, but not a whole lot before. So in reality, your 400 feet is about this big. That's a big area. We don't have to touch down on that number, we can touch down 50 foot past it. We can touch down 100 feet past it. 199, and I say this on every flight test, uh, uh, in, or excuse me, in this case, 399 on the normal landing. 399 feet is better than minus one. You put your wheels here before the point, I've got to grade it. You put your wheels here in the middle of the box, no problem. Here, middle of the box, no problem. Here, whether I'm on this side of that line or, 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 or that side of the line, you know, it's hard for me to tell. But if I'm down here, it's very easy for me to tell if I'm down on this end of the line. So I'm going to come back to this uh, picture in a little bit. But I'm going to clear my annotations. Actually, I'm just going to do it while I'm here. So let's say you're doing a short field landing, which is minus, oh, come on. which is minus zero plus 200. Well, if that's 500, that's about 250 halfway in between. So that's probably about 200. Still a very large area. 199 feet is better than, plus 199 is better than that minus one. Your wheels touch here, I got a grade A. Wheels touch here, you're in the box. Makes no difference. It's more important to make a good landing. Bleed the speed off, nose high. Wheels on the other side of the center line at the far end of the box than it is to make a hard landing, a flat landing, forced landing on the line or just past the line. You can see that actually the problems with the short field are pretty much the same as with the 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 um, um, the normal, not on center line, uh, failure to make a stabilized approach, poor use of aim point, touchdown point. 
The only thing I added there is failure to clear the obstacle uh, on the landing. Uh, a lot of times that uh, if we give a, an, an obstacle because it's hard to visualize, people get too close to it. Um, and it's better to be a little bit uh, more aware of that. Um, so I'm gonna go back to that picture and talk about that. What's the relationship between your aim point and the obstacle? Let's say we put the obstacle right here. How far down the runway should your touchdown point be? That's the big question. Well, it can actually kind of come from the POH. And go back over here. Okay, so I'm in section five of the performance manual, and I'm going to go to my landing table, which is the end of section five. Um, using a short field technique, my landing distance, I'm just going to use sea level. Uh, my landing distance at uh, um, 20 centigrade is um, 1350. Okay, so 1350. Oops, I don't want that yellow. I want that. Back to my red. I'll use blue. So that's my distance if I'm landing over that 50 foot obstacle to come to a stop. So then I have a ground roll of 585. So that's the distance from where I touch the runway to where I stop. So the distance between my touchdown point and my obstacle is 1350 minus 588. Now, I'm not really talking about this because you need to be exact. I'm just trying to talk about this so we have an idea of distance so I can draw a picture for you. So 1350 minus 588, or 585, 765 feet. That's the distance between obstacle and my touchdown point. So let's go back to that picture. 760 feet from this obstacle to wherever my touchdown point is. Well, that would be right about there. That'd be about 750 feet from the, be from the beginning of the runway. That's where I place the obstacle. So if if you, if, if you tell me, I've got a 50-foot obstacle at the threshold, I'm going to touch down on the 500-foot markers. I know that's not going to happen. I know you're going to hit the obstacle. I don't even have to, to watch the rest of the landing to know you're going to hit the obstacle. Now, in a real-world scenario, I'm going to go ahead and clear all these annotations to go back to this one. In a real-world scenario where there's a real obstacle, you're going to see it. And that's one of the reasons why. Uh, we go out to Umatilla because there's a little, there are obstacles at Umatilla. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're now going out to, um, uh, where are we going? What's the name of the field? Uh, Osborne. Uh, that thing's got like 100 foot trees on either end of it. And so you really get to see what an obstacle looks like. And we can show you that if you have a real obstacle, you're not going to see your aim point until you are high enough to clear the obstacle. And so a real obstacle is easier than these fake obstacles that we might test you on. Um, so do I really want to cut it so close that I'm trying to touch down at 750 feet? Probably not. So I'm going to say I'm going to touch down at 1,000 feet. So I know I've got about a 500-foot ground roll, so that's still plenty short. I just got to figure out what my aim point is. So that's where my five times the airspeed comes, ground speed comes in. So let's say I've got a, a five-knot headwind. I'm coming down at 60 knots. Um, you know, I've got to be about 300 feet forward, and that's about where that line is. So that's my aim point. 
and this is my touchdown point. But I don't look at my touchdown point. Not until, or I only look at it on downwind. When I'm coming down, I'm looking at my aim point, follow my aim point, using my glide path to my aim point, and I round out and flare. Another thing I see people do is they try to use the pappy. Well, the pappy does take them to the thousand foot marker, so a lot of times that's why they say I'm using thousand foot marker. Well, guess what? I can tell you I want you to land on the 1500 foot markers if I want. You should be able to put an airplane on any spot on the runway. What would be an example of why I would have to touch down at 1500 feet instead of 1000 feet? And yes, I do expense, expense, expect somebody to answer that question for me. Real, real, real world reason. Wing turbulence um, avoidance. Wait, turbulence avoidance. It happens all the time. You're following a golf stream for landing. Where are they going to touch down? Somewhere between the thousand and the and the and the and the fifteen hundred. Watch them sometime. They're like clockwork. They hit the same spot every time they land. Why? Because they understand how to land land the airplane, dissipate the energy. Um, yeah, they're using some electronic glide path to. To put them there but they're managing their their airspeed and having that stabilized approach that's why they consistently get that same spot so that's just an example in in where i can say okay looks like we got we're following a golf stream today uh where are you going to put it on the runway um uh, thousand foot markers that probably not a good idea how about land on the 1500 foot markers for me so now you're using a completely different aim point but you should be able to use any aim point needed to to get there um not aligned with or over the center line. This is generally when there's a crosswind involved. Um, we get down and we get in the flare and we forget about the drift. We've compensated for it nicely coming down final. Uh, we've used a crosswind correction as we started the flare, but in the flare, because we're so close to the runway, um, there is a natural apprehension to uh, make the proper correction. But as you'll see in the ACS, we have to be wheels either side of the center line um, on touchdown, not side loaded. Um, and uh, that uh, um, that's one of those things that I've actually had people land not on the center line. I mean, halfway to the runway edge and at a commercial level. And I asked him, so were you over center line on landing? Yeah, I was. <laughs> like, no, you weren't. I'm glad you were looking down the runway, though. <laughs> So now soft field landing. Okay, I'm getting on my scope box on this one. Um, nobody outside of our school does these well. We take an extra time to make sure you know how to do a, a, a soft field a landing on a real soft runway. Um, but most of the people that are the schools, um, you know, obviously stabilized approach, uh, poor use of aim point. Now, in, in all reality, there is no touchdown point on on the soft field landing because you're coming in, you're, 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 you're bringing it in on, a, on an approach, you're getting the airplane and landing attitude, and then you're adding power. And you should touch down with power applied. Um, power should go to idle so you get into the round out and flare, but then you're adding power back in to keep airflow over the elevator to keep the nose in the air and uh and to soften the touchdown and that keeping that nose in the air is after is about all about that after touchdown because if you ever land on a real soft runway the we main wheels touch the runway and they sink and they start drag there's a lot of drag on them uh not like when you touch down on a on a, on a, on a hard surface runway um and it tends to pull the nose down into the mud or the snow and if it buries this nose wheel the airplane's going to flip over um, and uh, that's a bad day for everybody. Um, that it's probably something that everybody can walk away from, but still something you would want to avoid. So the right technique is not practiced uh, very much. Um, and uh, but as you look at the ACS, it it's very clear on that they expect the nose wheel to be off the runway and be kept off the runway as long as possible. Well, how do you do that if uh, if your wheels are in the mud and the nose is being pulled down, you have to add power, whatever power it takes to continue uh, to keep that nose in the air. And so, you know, this has some of the same common errors of the other landings, but normally um, they, they, they don't touch down in the nose high. They think it's nose high, but it's not. And then they fail to maintain it. They fail to, fail to add power to maintain it. 
So I'm gonna look at the ACS on all the landings here. So normal landing. Um, sure as the airplane is aligned with co the correct and assigned runway, uh, you don't want to be like Southwest. Um, basically making sure that the area is clear. Select and aim for a suitable touchdown point considering the wind, landing surface, and conditions. That's where a lot of people can get confused because they are using the term aim and touchdown point in the same sentence. But if you go into the um, airplane flying handbook, or if you were in the seminar Evan gave a couple weeks ago, wonderful discussion of aim point relationship to touchdown point, um, and uh, that uh, um, that uh, that is that is uh, um, a good thing. I know we, I think we've kept a copy of that to if people want to get sent a copy or send a link, you can rewatch it. Um, Recommend approach and landing configuration and airspeed and just pitch and attitude and power as required to maintain a stabilized approach. Stabilized approach is minimal pitch and power train change to arrive at the aim point at the proper speed, at the proper altitude. Um, maintain the approach speed or an absence of that, of that not from 1.3 VSO. And that's an example of where we're talking about um, the uh, Cessna says 65 knots for a normal approach. They really say between 60 and 70, so that's where we interpret 65. Um, and uh, so that number's coming from the manufacturer. If that wasn't a fact, then we would use the, the, the FAA calculation if the manufacturer didn't give us anything or didn't give us an indication of anything. Um, so maintain direct scroll appropriate crosswind correction throughout the approach and landing. So you get wheels on the ground and you let go of the aileron control and we start skidding. That would be the area that would be unsatisfactory, would be uh, uh, S8. Make smoothly and timely correct control application during round, round out and touchdown. Touchdown at a proper pitch attitude within 400 feet beyond or on the specified point with no side drift and with the airplane's longitudinal axis aligned with and over the normal center line. So what does that mean? That means that we can't be skidding left or right. The wheels need to touch down and be aligned with the runway. And you need to have either main wheel, um, you know, the main wheels have to be on either side of the center line. Um, that that is the way the FAA would interpret that. So if we land and I'm looking out my window on my side and the center line is off the right of the airplane, we're not over the, the center line of the runway and that would be a reason for disapproval. So you got to realize that we don't have a whole lot of latitude when it comes to landing. The other part about it is, it says, execute a timely go around if the approach cannot be made with intolerance as specified above or for any other condition that may result in an unsafe approach or landing. Right there, it tells you, hey, you can always go around. I know that song is going to, you know, come through a few people's head and they're going to scream, but we play it all day long. We haven't heard it in a month, so I'm looking forward to hearing it again. Uh, but no, you can always go around. And that's the thing. If your wheels touch the runway, I've got a grade. But if you opt for a go around, hey, set yourself up better next time. Try it again. Now, can you do unlimited go rounds? The answer to that is no. But more than one, yes. You know, um, I had a customer of mine fail with Diego on a flight test because on the fourth attempt, at a short field landing in a tailwind, he forced it on the runway. After three go arounds, um, I asked him, I, you know, I met him at the airplane. He's like, I know, I know, I should have asked for a different runway. Um, and, uh, and I said, what, what do you think would have happened if you would have done a go around on that fourth one? He would have said, fine. And uh, I said, the other thing, what should you have done? Because they weren't giving them the runway. I should have discontinued. He had all the right answers, but on that day, he let the, uh, the stress of the check ride get to him and he made a bad decision. And, um, and, it, that, uh, 
ended up in 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 a failure. Yes, we went flu one time and we went back up for the flight test and did just fine, didn't have the same wound conditions, et cetera. Um, but that's where that always go around is true. And it's, it, you know, yeah, if somebody is trying to make a normal landing on their, on their third or fourth attempt, okay, we might have an issue. But, you know, if, 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 you know, they did go a couple go rounds on the, the normal couple go rounds on the short, okay, they're getting it figured out. They do eventually put it in within the tolerances we're fine. Uh, we just, like I say, can't, can't go out there for all day long. And this is the opposite of some of the guidance we had from the FAA about five years ago. They were saying, no, one go around only on a flight test. And we're like, huh? That kind of contradicts what we're doing in training. So I li I'm glad they changed this verbiage. All right. So looking at the short field landing or soft field landings next, so we'll just go talk about that. So here is where if you look at um, Nine, let's see, S9, make smooth and timely correction control inputs during the round out and touchdown. And for a tricycle gear airplane, keeps the nose wheel off the surface until loss of elevator effectiveness. In a real soft field, you're going to use throttle to keep airflow over the elevator to keep the elevator effective. And, uh, you know, so if you're, if you're trying to nurse that out to get to a point where you can turn off the runway, that is how you would, how we do it. Touches down at a proper pitch attitude with minimum seat rate, no side drift with the airplane's larger than the last sort of the center of the runway. Okay, that's pretty much the same. Um, let's see. And talks about the airspeed. Okay, so it talks about the airspeed. If you read the POH, it does not have a specified airspeed for um, the um, um, the landing, and uh, and so that's why we just use the the low end of the normal approach speed because you do want to touch down at a slower speed. Um, more momentum would cause that pitch that nose to pitch down and get into the mud a little bit earlier, uh, as well as it's the same number as calculated uh, for the um, Airplane for the uh, short field landing, so that's why we use that number. Um, and then the short field, big thing here is uh, everything is pretty much the same as far as maintaining speeds, stabilize approach. Um, that's a takeoff. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, stabilized approach, suitable touchdown point, um, and. Uh, establishes approach and landing configuration, airspeed, just pitch attitude. Um, the big, biggest difference with all of this is uh, S10. Touch it down at proper pitch attitude, which means a nose high attitude with, within 200 feet beyond or specified point threshold markings or runway numbers uh, with no side drift, minimum float, and with airplanes longitude axis, axis aligned over the runway center line. So this, everything is exactly the same. We just have less speed coming in, five knots less speed, and we have, uh, which means our aim point's gonna be closer to our touchdown point, and means that we have a, um, uh, a smaller window. But 199 plus is better than minus one. And once again, S12. Execute timely go around if approach cannot be made with intolerance and specified above uh, for any other conditions may result in unsafe flight. Okay, so I know I'm going to be short. I feel like I'm, I'm in the flare. I feel like I'm drifting. I made the mistake of looking at the touchdown point. I'm probably going to be short. I execute the go around. So I add power. Um, what happens if my wheels touch after I add power? Well, it says effective effect execute a timely go around. The go around is to prevent that from happening. However, I have seen scenarios where the momentum, the decision was made late, the momentum does cause the, the wheels to touch. And it's going to have to be a, a case by case scenario when you're when you're looking at that. But just realize that the idea is wheels touch, we've got a grade. Um, then it says, you know, use manufacturer working procedures for airplane configuration and braking, uh, you know, whatever the manufacturer says in the checklist, uh, or we say in our checklist uh, to stop the airplane. 
All right. Um, as I predicted, I'm not going to have time to get into the instrument rating because we're five to nine. Um, I apologize. What I will do is I will, a uh, couple weeks down the road, um, I will. Uh, that I will um, uh, have another session like this. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I wanna get through the instrument um, and I wanna get through the commercial. Um, so I will have probably two more sessions like that. We'll let you know via, via text and email, um, but uh, um, that uh, I do wanna open it up. I wanna take whatever time we got left. I'm willing to stay past nine to answer questions. I can answer questions on all flight tests. Doesn't have to be the, uh, uh, I mean, obviously the, the private, but we can be instrument or, or commercial. So if you want to turn your mics on and um, start firing away, I'll stay as long as we got questions. Yo, Ed, how long is a flight test? The flight test depends uh, as far as the actual flight time. If we're talking about the private, it's usually anywhere between 1.5 and 2.0. However, I have had some horrendous issues with ATC from time to time, and I've, I've actually had, um, I had one clock in at three hours once because, uh, and it, it was an instrument one um, because of ATC, wouldn't give you this, wouldn't give you that. We had to go a long ways to get what we needed to meet the con uh, context of the, um, um, of the test. But private, normally 1.5 to 1.8, 2.0 as far as flight. The oral, of course, can vary between you know, an hour and a half and two and a half. Uh, depends on how you answer the questions and how comfortable you are. I'm not gonna rush you. I don't want you to to feel pressure for me to get something done. So I I generally say, you wanna take a break, take a break. You know, um, that uh, uh, yeah, I might be behind starting for the next guy, but they're gonna understand that because I'm gonna tell them the same thing. It's your test, it's your pace. And what about maneuvers? How much time do you give between maneuvers? I'd like to go through them as quick as I can. I will, I will ask for one immediately after, but if you say, hey, I need a minute to think through this one. Okay, no problem. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Hey, Ed. Yeah. When you uh, when you do the testing, do you ever actually go out to Osborne for soft field? Not usually. I mean, I have gone into a pop gun in a number of cases uh, because it's convenient. Um, sometimes if the winds aren't favorable uh, at executive, I'll say, hey, do you want to get your landings done at Leesburg? Um, because we're, we, we might be out that way for it. Um, rarely do I get all the way out to Osborne. Um, that uh, um, unless unless for some reason the cross country took us there. Now, most of the time if I'm out there and I'm, I'm doing a cross country that direction and I get, uh, I give a scenario, if more time more times than not, people pick like Leesburg to go back to instead of trying to pick one of those grass fields. That'd be another example where, okay, you just let your engine over it. Yeah, then I'd probably go into it. All right, cool, thanks. But let me clarify that you would have to find it first to decide to go into it because you see it on the map. But once you to try to find it just by looking at it, as I said earlier, that's usually the toughest thing when you pick a restricted airport is it's green on green. Maybe you'll find a white building to spot it and then then realize, oh, that's the runway. Yeah, good advice. Yeah, I've had many people pick an open field next to an airport because it was big and green and had no obstacles. And you know what? That's okay. That's not going to be a reason for a failure on a flight test. If they were able to safely execute it and it would be something we could, we could walk away from. If they, you know, were too low, going to hit a power line, different story. Um, Anybody that tuned in after we got started, just so you're all aware, uh, I made an announcement at the beginning. We have had discussions and uh, our intention is 
Uh, we hear that the governor is going to be talking about changing some things around tomorrow. Uh, our plan is to start flight operations on Monday, May 4th. And we will be giving everyone, Keith and myself will be giving, uh, we're splitting the list and calling everybody and just making sure everybody knows what we're doing, knows the measures we're taking to make sure everybody's safe um and uh and uh, stay healthy and uh and talk to you about uh, getting back in the routine and who's ready to get going and and uh, re reignite the flying because it's been gorgeous i wanted to go fly so bad hey um, i think where... the governor uh does make his announcement um are going to specify all the things you're going to do or is that going to be in the phone call They'll be in the phone call. Okay. They'll be in the phone call. But, uh, you know, and it, it's, it, you know, the bottom line is whatever the governor says doesn't really technically apply because there, there was a lot of clarification in mid-April about flight schools and flight instructors as being essential. Uh, so it, we, we, we could have been open the whole time. We just felt that it was our duty to, you know, um, do our part to, you know, stave off and, and uh, flatten the curve, as they say. And so, um, you, you know, everything we've heard is, is you know, if we, if we act responsibly, it shouldn't spike. Um, uh, um, and, uh, you know, and we're pretty comfortable that this group of people acts responsibly. You know, we fly airplanes. Um, you know, will I be going out to a restaurant anytime soon? Yeah, probably not. Uh, <laughs> I still, I'll still do the takeout, but yeah, yeah, I'm not ready for that myself. Yeah, me either. Um, where do you see the plane industry going now after the coronavirus? You know, it, 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 you know, if you look back at history, you know, uh, I think there's going to be a little bit of a slowdown, but I can't tell you whether that's going to be a six month or twelve month. Uh, that uh, it really depends on how people go back to flying, um, how many airplanes are going to need, how many pilots are going to need. Um, I have been through um, a number of resets. Obviously, uh, September 11th, there was a there was a reset. That everything was going gangbusters. Projected unbelievable hiring requirements. Uh, and then that came and it slowed us down for, for uh, a, a year. Um, same thing in 2008 when the economy tanked, um, that uh, airlines slowed down and that slowed down. Again, the big difference between now and then is the number of retirees. One of the things they did in 2000, in the late 2000s to kick the can down the road, they raised the retirement age to 65. They're not gonna do that again. Uh, and they've actually had some pilots take early retirement saying, I'm done with this, you know, uh, let the younger people do it. Um, you know, you, you, I think it was American Airlines had 600 pilots that took early retirement because the airline offered it to them as a way to keep people that wanted to work working. So, uh, but yeah, they, nobody has a crystal ball to know for sure. Is it, is it going to affect it? Yeah. Um, but it's cyclical. It, 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 it comes back and it usually comes back stronger than it was before at least and i've been doing this 30 wait 38 years uh, that it, it, it does that and uh, so like i say that's why i tell people is if you're in the process get it done get ready because it's better to be on the front of a wave than the back of a wave the back of the wave are the people that get furloughed um and that's where some of the people right now that went to the airlines in the last year they're going to they're going to be the ones the last two years they're going to be the ones that are going to be affected by that the people uh behind them won't be and the people in front of them won't be so that's that's the thing that we see a lot of any other questions hey ed it's crystal how are you I love the uh, the outline you sent. That was nice. Oh, you liked it? Good. Oh, yes. let me know if they, I have some modifications or improvements. I'm glad you got it, though. Um, I had a question going back to one of your very first slides. I think the answer is yes, but I just want to confirm with you. So mm -hmm. if you go up and you are doing an evaluation and everything's going okay, but you have a maneuver that is a failure, and the examiner says, right, this is going to be a failure. Do you want to continue or do you want to go ahead and head on back? 
and the student says, right, I wanna shake it off, I wanna continue and start crossing off as many items as we can in the time allotted. Yes. Is it my understanding that, right, so when they go back up to do the retest, not only can they be retested on the, um, the item that was unsatisfactory, but they actually, the examiner could pull from any of those other items that he's already looked at? Technically, yes. Practically, no. Um, now, let's say the scenario is um, you, you, you had one item unsatisfactory, a couple items incomplete, you're going to do those items. Mm -hmm. But you had a normal landing that, that was, you, you know, you've, you've passed the normal landings um, and, uh, and, and all the landings, and maybe the problem was, uh, was, was steep turns. And you go out and you do the steep turns and you, and you come back in and the examiner has to take controls because you, you lost, uh, lost control on landing. Uh, yeah, that's going to be checked off as an unsatisfactory. It's not something they're going to actively go out and say, well, we got to do this, this, and this. However, if you don't go back to the same examiner, that's where the examiner does have the, the, the new examiner has the right to retest everything. And that's where one of the things is, okay, well, who gave you the other test? Oh, I know Don. Don's pretty good. If Don says this is weak, this is weak, I'm not going to worry about testing on those other things. Or sometimes we'll call the other examiner and say, hey, this, this, and this happened. You know, I've got this person, you know, um, just wanted to make sure that all this stuff was good. Because I ultimately, we're signing off on the, on the, on the final uh, certification. So um, the FA gives us the latitude. Most don't take it just because, you know, it's to get to where you've gotten you got there for a reason. So they're not, they're not going to go back and retest everything unless it really is warranted. I see. Okay. That's really good to know. Thank you. Cool. What are the price ranges of the practical? Well, it depends on what part of the state you're in. Be glad you're in central Florida. 850 on the East coast. 800 on the West Coast, and that's just for a private. Fortunately, here we're a little bit more sane at 600. Um, you know, so that the, uh, um, CFI initials, I've heard up to 1300. Um, I, I've heard uh, most commonly uh, here locally, though, in, in the center part of the state is about 900. Um, double eyes, and just because I know that's that's what you're looking at, Robert, uh, are usually the same as private that there's they don't they don't have an upcharge for that because it's not a full day ride um that uh, that you're probably looking around 600 with kyle all right anybody else before we go no nope, i'm good ed thanks a lot all right well i want to remind everybody tomorrow night Trivia night, 8 p.m. Trivia yeah, night! But... It's gonna be fun! <laughs> you can win money! Bro I, I just looked, my double eye with Robert was 600. Or with uh, with Kyle, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to say that's, 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 yeah. that's you know, unless he changed yeah. his rates while we've been doing not doing this, although he did shut down for a good period of time, too. Um, Are there any themes to trivia night? Besides just generally aviation and the entire um, aviation? Yes, our trivia night tomorrow will have a multiple choice category. We will have a category that I like to call closest to the pin. We will have a category of pictures and we will also do another round of do you know your flight instructor? <laughs> And it's going to be a blast. <laughs> yeah, I think eight o'clock would be better. You know, people can get dinner before. So say again. I said I think eight o'clock is going to be better just because people can get dinner before. Yes, grab a cocktail and join That's me. That's why I want to grab dinner for before. some for some for some brain strain. All right, and, and then and aviation uh, general and aviation history trivia. Yeah, there's history. 
Oops, I left that slip. What? <laughs> Perfect, thank you. <laughs> what? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, then Thursday okay, night, we have the um, um, Evans course, um, which I'm not sure if we're airworthiness items or if it's aeromedical, um, but uh, that's at seven o'clock as well. So we got eight o'clock tomorrow night, seven o'clock on Thursday night, and then flying. And yes, I may shave. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Don't do it, Ed. No. <laughs> well, Tony, if mine looked as good as yours, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. I'm glad you joined us. Um, hope to see you uh, on trivia tomorrow night and uh, then uh, class on with Evan on Thursday night and then at the airport next week. All right. Have a good night. Yeah, have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. See ya. See ya. Thank you. Have a good one. Yeah.